Let's look to our Lord in prayer. And so, Father, we're thanking you now, thanking you for this tremendous opportunity that we have here to be able to explore, to think, to examine, reflect upon your word and how it relates to our lives. We have to think personally. We have to think regionally. We have to think nationally. We have to think globally. We stay balanced, Father, in the midst of all this. So, Father, help us now to see how the eternal word is relevant to contemporary times. Warm these hearts. Engage these minds. Shape these wheels. As again, our Father, we've come here to see Jesus and, and him only. And we're praying these things now again in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, Cape Canaveral was the scene, the setting, the focal point. Another launch was to take place. SpaceX was to head off Saturday. But out of Cape Canaveral comes these words, gusty winds, associated with a subtropical low-pressure system, prevented United Launch Alliance from sending an Atlas V rocket into the orbit Saturday from Cape Canaveral. I continue to read the excerpt, trying to understand a little better, because I was anticipating this launch. And further on down in the description are these words. The ground winds exceeded the limit of what we could safely fly through, said Giuliano, a ULA spokesperson. Officials called off the countdown at T minus one minute and 40 seconds. They went on record as saying, what we want is a good launch. What you and I are exploring now in Acts chapter 13, verse 1 down through verse 12, is what we might describe as a, a good launch. The conditions were favorable because there in Antioch we find a core of believers that are in prayer and they're worshiping the Lord. And out of all of this, the Holy Spirit breaks into the scene and creates a scenario whereby Barnabas and Saul are about to be sent out, launched if you will, to begin what will eventually be a global ministry of high-impact, gospel-based presentations of the work of Jesus Christ. What I want to do is to examine this launch with you. There are three aspects to this launch that I want to be able to draw out for us as we're thinking about how this relates to the work of Jesus Christ, and in turn, what does it entail for you, and what does it entail for me? <coughs> well... As you and I, as we embark upon sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is our model. Note, first of all, with me that obedience is essential. And you're going to see the necessity for obedience in verses 1 down through verse 3. Obedience is essential. So now, notice how contemporary the physician Luke is with his very first word. Now, it seems as though there has been a countdown in the eternal realm. The gospel has gone from Jerusalem through Judea into Samaria, and now there is this waiting period as all the stakeholders are being lined up and strategically put together in order for what I might call a mission team to be established and properly launched. When God wants to do a great work in your family or in your life, watch how he will take the strategic players in and around you and in ways that you nor I can fully imagine, in perfect timing, as we wait upon God worshipfully, he pulls these people together, and when the conditions are favorable, something significant occurs. 
But what makes for conditions to be favorable? Now, there were in the church at Antioch, notice these words, prophets and teachers. Now, he doesn't go out of his way, the physician at this point, to delineate and distinguish. He simply notes them and then draws out for us the names of various individuals. What I want you to see here is the diversity of the leadership. They are ethnically diverse. Antioch is a cosmopolitan city of roughly a half million people at this point, strategic, right near the Mediterranean. And so now, within this cosmopolitan setting, Antioch, not Jerusalem now, is positioned to be the launching pad for global outreach at this moment in God's sovereign purposes. God now allows for this missionary team of five to be pulled together. There's Barnabas. Barnabas is from Cyprus, isn't he? We've been introduced to him in the earlier chapters of the book of Acts where when he saw needs within the extended church fellowship around Jerusalem, he went out of his way to make certain that his financial resources were also being made available to others. And then, when he made his way upwards to Antioch, commissioned by Jerusalem to do this, he looked at the situation there in this cosmopolitan realm and sought out a man named Saul of Tarsus. We will know him as the Apostle Paul, won't we? Barnabas, whose name means literally son of encouragement, and that he was. And I hope you are that way too in your relationships with others. He's from Cyprus, and they're going to be heading to Cyprus, and we're going to see in the moments to come. The next man is Simeon, called Niger, and what that means from Latin is that it carries with the idea of there's a blackness to his tent, his skin coloring. He's from Africa. And then there's Lucius, who's evidently from North Africa. And then there's Manion. And fascinating to us is that he rubbed shoulders with Herod the Tetrarch, didn't he? And so he knew something about the political systems in and around the region where Jesus had ministered. And then there's Saul, Saul of Tarsus. It's a cosmopolitan group. And what is utterly fascinating is that Saul of Tarsus, the one who was the persecutor of the Christian, Jewish Christians, around Acts chapter 8 and 9, causing them to be spread geographically, will now become Paul the Apostle so that the gospel might in turn be spread geographically. This is brilliant, and this shows the transformative workings of grace. God can take someone in your life, someone that you might be prone to simply write off at this point, saying it seems as though he or she has such a hardened heart. And he can take a saw and transform that individual into a Paul, speaking metaphorically at this point, do a 180 degrees in the eyes of other individuals, forcing them to be able to see that God is sovereign and he can transform life. Don't write off anybody in your extended family or in your circle of relationships right now thinking that they are too hard to be able to reach. What God does then is that he takes a cosmopolitan setting, Antioch, and out of this, he creates a unity in the midst of this diversity based upon true biblical Christianity. I love what's here. I love the diversity. I love the unity. But I love the fact that we are dealing with the integrity of God's word, his inerrant word. Hillsong. People, come together. Strange as neighbors are, blood is one. Children, of all generations, of every nation of kingdom come. There's a verse that goes on to say, Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. And then they have this brilliant bridge at this point, 
Swing wide, all you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God, his name is Jesus. People, come together, strangest neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. And now you've got in microcosmic form with these five names listed in these opening verses. What God will do in the macrocosmic state is the gospel will go forth and how he took the persecutor who caused the people who love Jesus to be spread out globally, transforms him then into the apostle Paul so then the word via through him might go out globally. This is your sovereign God, you see, at work. Now, we need a proper launch. We need a great launch. And so how do you go about doing that? We need the climate conditions to be just right. So when you are looking for God to do something highly transformative, when you are seeking God, and you want a sense of direction in the midst of the confusion, you're up to verse 3. Then, you start it with a now in verse 1. You connect it to the then in verse 3. After having made your way through these names, global names in verse 2, then, notice what's taking place here for the climate conditions to be just right. Fasting and praying. In other words, the fasting was a means to sharpen the focus of the praying, you see. So that they stay centered upon who matters most. They stay centered upon what matters most. Now, if in the midst of these fluid times of your own personal life, you're willing to replace rigidity with flexibility when it comes to your strategy, while remaining focused upon who matters most and what matters most. God, try in God. Jesus Christ, who died for your sins. The inerrant word of God, the truth. When you allow for that to shape your, what I'll call your climate conditions for proper launch, good launch, in fact, a perfect launch, after fasting and praying, notice what happens now. They laid their hands on them. The Holy Spirit had said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them, sent them off. So now, they're worshiping. They're fasting. The Holy Spirit breaks in. And as the Holy Spirit breaks in, God's word goes forth. And he has now singularly identified two individuals, Barnabas and Saul. What is utterly fascinating is that Barnabas and Saul have developed now about a year's work of being co-workers. They understand the rhythms of each other. Barnabas sought out Saul so they could minister effectively in a teaching ministry within Antioch. And so now, they have done their preparatory work locally in order to be able to work then globally. Now, God does a tremendous amount of preparatory work. And so as he does his preparatory work and he pulls people together, people that you would not necessarily identify as being natural, as being put together, and these are different personality types, these two. Nonetheless, God shapes them for a year worth of, of investing in the local region before they invest themselves in the global region. And then says, sit apart from me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them, not the congregation, but God. You see. 
In other words, they are to identify and acknowledge outwardly what the Holy Spirit has already done inwardly. God has been at work within them. And so now there's outward affirmation of this sense of inward compulsion. When William Carey, working in his shop in London, was longing to be used in some powerful way for God, we're told that in the 1700s, this man, a cobbler by trade, kept a map of the world on a wall so, of his workshop so that he could pray for the nations of the world, not knowing how and when he might be used in that way. Faced some obstacles, because when he shared his bird in a meeting with other pastors, he was told by one of them, young man, sit down, when God wants to reach them, he'll do it without your help or mine. But his biography tells us that he did not let the fire of his desire, and what is the fire of your desire, be dampened by this response. So he eventually left the shores, headed off to India, and then there's the rest of the story high impact for God's glory. So now, God might be using all these years of preparation for that timely opportunity that you have for fully being involved in the integration of ministry at a bigger and bigger scale. You know, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness of preparation. Long time. But God views the preparation time differently than you and I do. Use it wisely. Invest your time. Don't waste your time. And as you do so, remember that obedience is essential. In this situation, it's not a subjective obedience. It's an objective obedience because God had directly spoken through the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit who inspired the word of God. So after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them. That was a matter of obedience and sent them off. And there you have it. And now something of significance begins to occur. God is at work. In one of my history books, I'm told Spain once held both sides of the Mediterranean at the Straits of Gibraltar. So highly did she value her possessions that she stamped on her coin the two pillars of Hercules on a scroll thrown over these were these words. Ne plus ultra in the Latin, which means literally no more beyond. But you see, one day, one day there was this bold spirit who decided to sail far beyond what they considered to be no more beyond, Columbus. And so they had to strike the no from their coin. And they were left with the plus ultra, more beyond. What Saul and Barnabas realize at this point there's more beyond. And so they wait for the proper launch. They wait for the perfect conditions. Out of obedience to the Word of God, they head out. There's your first aspect in good launching. That as we embark upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to want to note with me that obedience, obedience here is essential. Now, we've shown some pictures of Antioch, if you were able to click on. And I also want you, if you're able to click on, be able to notice with me the map that's used to describe uh, the first journey of the Apostle Paul. The first journey. Back in 2017, some of the family members, we headed off to track the journeys of the Apostle Paul. 
And so some of these scenes will become increasingly presented in these expositions still to come. But there you see the map, and there you see the opportunity to see how the movement then shifted from Antioch to the first setting whereby which Paul and, and Barnabas were able to begin sharing the gospel, a setting known as Cyprus. Cyprus. You pick it up now in verse 4. And as you pick it up now in verse 4, it's going to lead us then to this second aspect that as you and I, as we embark upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only do we see the obedience here that's essential in 1 through 3, but second of all, the opposition, which is inevitable in verses 4 through 8. If you're going to do something significant for God, if you want God to do something significant in the people you are most burdened for, obedience is essential to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. But opposition is inevitable when you are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, you see. Because the evil one wants to keep the doors closed and wants to keep the climate, climate conditions to be such that you just can't do a good launch. Well, they've headed out. And so, so, being sent out by the Holy Spirit at this point, they went down to Seleucia, not far from the Orontes River, modern-day southern Turkey, uh, then around the region of the northern tip of Syria. From there, they would sail off to Cyprus. Now, a word about Cyprus. You can see some pictures, perhaps, if you want to check them out. 1974, Turkish invasion. And this land, which has been predominantly associated with Greece, once again finds Turkey and Greece in tension with one another, as they have been throughout history. Think the Battle of Troy back in ancient times and so on. The Trojan horse and so on. On into the very present. The northern sector, you see, is Turkish and somewhat austere and mountainous. The southern sector is the one that people like to go to vacation at, picturesque. You might want to go swim with some turtles, sea turtles there. It's beautiful. Well, while you're there, you're able to begin to see the significant setting that God was using is the very first step in the means by which the Apostle Paul is going to have high impact for the expression and the communication of the gospel. You're up to verse 5. They arrive at Salamis. We've got some pictures there for you. What do they do? Go for a swim? Pull out their phones and take pictures of the scenery? Notice what comes first. They proclaim the word of God. Priorities. They proclaim the word of God. Where? Where? in the synagogues of the Jews. Now what is utterly interesting is that in the midst of the persecution, if you were to quickly shift back in your Bible into chapter 11 of verse 19, you would read, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. See the connection between the two? speaking the word to no one except Jews at this point. Now, what God then has done through that persecution is to set forth and to set loose the word of God, and it's made its way in advance to Cyprus then, even before Barnabas and Saul set foot. This is again how God prepares the way. You don't go anywhere without God having preceded you in the movements by the Holy Spirit. And so now, when they arrive on the scene, teachings had already occurred, but now this will be coherent. It will come together. It will make sense as people are listening, and perhaps listening furthermore even to the dramatic testimony that Saul of Tarsus would have to share with them about transforming grace. But they proclaim the word of God. Connecting the dots of the Old Testament to the, to the work of Jesus Christ death, resurrection, ascension, and so on. Where do they start? 
Well, as the Apostle Paul would later write to the Jew first, and then also to the Greek or to the Gentile, depending upon how you want to phrase it in your translation. But they start in the synagogues of the Jews, and we're told here they had John. This is John Mark to assist them. Luke is a physician. The word assist there in the Greek carries with the idea of a physician's assistant. If some who are watching right now are PAs, this is right up your alley. And so here's an individual that is there to serve what I will call, whom I will call, the great physician. And now Barnabas, son of encouragement, Saul of Tarsus, working together, setting of Cyprus. They're ministering effectively for the glory of God. Now, they're going to have to go through the whole island. It's not a large island. And they will start on the eastern side, closest to modern-day Syria, Turkey region, and make their way westward, you see. And as they make their way westward, they're heading towards the political center of the island. They're heading towards Paphos. Paphos. Now, it's very clear that Luke the physician understands the political structures on the island and how it related to the Roman Empire at that point by not only identifying Paphos, but also talking about what will come next. Now, as they make their way towards Paphos, they came upon a certain magician. You raise your eyebrows a certain amount, but the same word was used to describe those who appeared on the scene when Jesus was born, magi from the east, you see. Okay. And so we're dealing with the spiritualities of the east. And we will sometimes find that there is a blending of occultism and various aspects of eastern mysticism on the islands that are found further east from us. Such is the case here. So they, they come upon this certain magician but what fascinates you and fascinates me is that he is a Jewish false prophet. Just this past week, a wonderful young student, young lady, emailed me wanting to talk about, think about, think through the whole matter of understanding prophets in the Bible. Well done, Emily. Through it all, what we see here is that if you're going to have to evaluate true versus a false prophet, you're primary means of testing true versus false is found in Deuteronomy 13 and 18. And when you couple all of that together and you begin to think through how people were to, in that era, be able to identify the true versus the false, such as in Deuteronomy chapter 13, when someone is performing signs, when someone is producing miracles, so it seems, what is critically important, you couple verses 1 and 2 with verses 3 through 5, and understand that it's got to be consistent with what God has already revealed in his word, that there is to be simply this outward attestation of what God's truth has already been conveyed to the people. And then when you make your way up to Deuteronomy chapter 18, because you want to connect 13 and 18, such people have got to be, of course associated with, connected with, of the Jewish population. But they've got to be communicating in the name of the Lord, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 19. And as they do so, then you have the opportunity to listen, whether they're talking about the near or the distant future aspects of life. Deuteronomy 13 and 18 has got to be understood in relation to how Saul of Tarsus and Barnabas are going to handle this guy. So here's this Jewish false prophet, and here is what is interesting, what comes next. His name is Ba-Jesus. Now, Ba means son. So, for example, Barabbas, son of the father. Uh, Peter, Simon Bar-Jonah, you see, son of Jonah. Ba in the Hebrew, son. Don't miss the irony. So this individual is a false prophet named some Jesus. He is with now the political leader on the island. His name is Sergius Paulus. 
In the 1870s, there was an inscription, 1878, an inscription found in Rome bearing this political leader's name. That shows you how historically accurate now Luke is in the way in which he is depicting what is unfolding in front of our very eyes. So there's Sergius Paulus. This is an educated man. He's a man of intelligence. What I want you to see now, the Holy Spirit is at work because not only has God been prepping the synagogues in advance prior to Barnabas and Saul's arrival, God is obviously prepping furthermore this proconsul's heart in advance because it's not Barnabas and Saul who are summoning the political leader. Uh -uh. No. Did you notice what's here? Instead, it's the political officer on the island who summons Barnabas and Saul. And furthermore, God is doing such a work of preparatory aspects within this man's heart he wants to hear the Word of God. Now, have you noticed how the Word of God is continuously being emphasized? In verse 5, they step on the island. First things first, proclaim the Word of God. This political figure summons them. Why? He wants to hear the Word of God. There's a summoning here. The word summoning carries with the idea of some kind of official political summoning. What do you do? Let's say God is providing an opportunity. But wherever there is opportunity to be had, opposition awaits. Opportunity and opposition are not separate from one another. They find a way of crowding one another, getting into each other's presence in the same room of life. So here comes Barnabas, here comes Saul. They want to share the word of God. This man is open. But notice what the evil one does. But Elamus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them seeking to turn the proconsul away, mark what comes next, from the faith. It doesn't say from faith. He's going to try to turn them away from the faith. Luke is very specific here in what he's saying. What are you saying now at this particular point in juncture is that we are dealing with the absolute essence of what, of what life is all about. The faith pertaining to everything surrounding the death, resurrection, ascension, return of Jesus Christ. Why, the physician Luke in Acts chapter 6 verse 7 wrote, And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. But now notice, the faith is not being localized within Jerusalem. The faith is being globalized beyond Jerusalem. And furthermore, the faith is getting personalized in the heart of of this political leader. Think about that. Now, look at the political landscape right now, say, just across our nation. You might look at the executive. You might look at the legislative. You might look at the judicial branches. Nobody is too far removed from God's transforming grace. This man's heart is open. This man is listening. But where there is great opportunity, there is great opposition. We've got to understand that. We are dealing here with not only matters of what is true. Simultaneously, you've got to be able to detect 
through Deuteronomy chapter 13 and 18 matters what's false. A decade after 1918, there was this sculptor. His name was Decina. A writer tells us, he reproduced many numerous pieces of Renaissance sculpture. It sold the majority at a high price to an art dealer who claimed that he simply disposed of them as copies. I'm reading now. However, as they were such great imitations, the dealers sold the pieces as originals. For incredible sums of money, to world's leading art museums and private collectors. Get this. Decina happened to learn the fact in 1928 and sued the crooked art dealer for part of the huge profits. The resultant publicity made Decina and his imitations so famous that at an auction of his works in New York five years later, the Italian government felt it advisable to give each buyer an official document that guaranteed his purchase to be a genuine fake of the sculptor. What do you think of that? Now, when you take Deuteronomy 13, coupled with Deuteronomy 18, and then apply it to what you and I are reading here, we see now how opportunity and opposition find their way into the same settings and are competing then for the same heart of an individual. So if you're burdened for anybody within your own circle of relationships right now, bear in mind, with opportunity comes opposition, with opposition comes opportunity. And then claim this. Greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. Obedience is essential, one through three. Opposition is inevitable, verse four through eight. Thirdly, grace is triumphant, 9 through 12. But Saul, who is also called Paul, very typical in Roman culture to have two names. Saul would have been his Hebraic name. Paul would have been his Greek name when he was known as Paulus. Put a U.S. at the end, like Sergio Paulus. That would have been his Latin name classical languages. What you see here now, Saul, who is also called Paul, and this is how he'll be known from this point on, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Notice what he says. You son of the devil. Now there's a way to start a conversation. But what's easy to overlook is that this man was identified as Ba-Jesus, the son of Jesus. And now, what Saul, now known as Paul, is able to do is to distinguish between the true and the false. And in the public hearing by which the political official and probably others are listening in, governmental officials... He is distinguishing. He is speaking of the good and the bad, righteousness versus evil. He cuts through the matter at this point. And he does so with an individual who has been a special counsel to the leading political figure on the island. Which means then that God can do the same. God can break into any particular setting among any particular group of people and be able to expose the fallacies of false counsel and provide true counsel. Let me go on to say it's not enough to simply say, I believe in counseling. There's good counsel and there's bad counsel. There's wrong counsel and there's right counsel. We need to be biblically based in our approach to things so that we don't create confusion. Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked at, intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? He brought Jesus now into this, you see. 
you can almost hear the sense of gasp in the crowd. Back to Hillsong. I don't want to be on my phone, but I can't be alone. Welcome to the modern world, the modern way. Trying to be somebody I'm not, but it's not what I want. Tell me there's another way. All the lights I chased are now faded. All the cheap thrills were only time wasted. Tell me why society's plan should define who I am. Surely there's a higher way. All of my best friends are sick of pretending. We want the truth. We want it. We want it. So much is missing. So give us the real thing. I know it's you. Is that good? And so now, it's almost like Hillsong broke in at this point. He gets contemporary. He takes what's timeless. He introduces what needs to be timely and says, now, behold, look what comes next. The hand of the Lord is upon you. The upper hand. When somebody's trying to get a handle on something, and notice H-A-N-D is part of the word hand, lettering of handle. When somebody is trying to take everything in their own hands, put the things in their own hands, what you are praying for is a revelation and a demonstration that God has the upper hand, that grace is triumphant. The hand of the Lord is upon you. You will be blind. And Saul knew something about that. Blinded on the road to Damascus. Unable to see the sun, but then don't miss the next point for a time. In other words, with justice comes mercy. God is allowing for a period of time for Elamas, Ba, Jesus, to come to his spiritual senses and put faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. That's why the phrasing for time. But notice the timeliness in the midst of the timelessness. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, so similar to the experience that Saul had on his, in his encounter with Jesus Christ. Now the same experience in his first presentation of Jesus in his global ministry a series of firsts. Darkness versus light fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him how by the hand. And when God has the upper hand, and when people have been resisting the upper hand, they're going to have to be led by the hand. And this is how Saul experienced it. This is how things work, you see. A medical physician in one of China's hospitals helped a man, cured a man of cataracts, a few days later, I'm reading now, 48 blind men came to the doctor from one of China's outside towns, all holding on to a rope guided by the man who had been cured. He had led them in this way, walking in chain 250 miles to the hospital. And then writes, the crowd may appear indifferent to their condition. Don't let this discourage us. Many are simply fumbling blindly after light. Sometimes it's in the midst of the darkness we realize the value of light. You might have a loved one right now in the midst of the darkness. It's then that they'll recognize the value of light. And light breaks in. And like Saul of Tarsus, it's transformative grace. To put it another way, God has the upper hand in all of this. Claim it. 
And so in verse 12, what do you make of this? Then the proconsul believed. In other words, the visual and the verbal, they come together for him. Something extraordinarily dramatic has taken place. And when he saw what had occurred, he was astonished at the teaching, at the teaching of the Lord. You see the value of biblical instruction? You see why we go verse by verse as we do, not topically. And so as they put it out of Cape Canaveral, gusty winds associated with a subtropical low-pressure system prevented United Launch Alliance from sending an Atlas V rocket into orbit Saturday from Cape Canaveral, the SpaceX. It's what caught my attention a little later. The ground winds exceeded the limit of what we could safely fly through. Officials called off the countdown at T minus one minute 40 seconds. We're waiting for favorable conditions to establish a perfect launch. When we start by worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, we create the favorable conditions for the perfect launch. Obedience is essential. Opposition, it's inevitable. But grace, it's triumphant. Let's close in prayer. So thanking you now, Father, for what you're teaching us in these 12 verses of this 13th chapter. For anybody struggling today with where is God in the midst of it all, I see darkness, not light. I see the lower hand, but not the upper hand. In just the right time, remind them, in just the right time, God sent forth his Son. God has a way of creating perfect launches is what they need to understand. So, Lord, break in. We trust your timing. We believe the truth. We trust the Savior. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.